Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Danvers Historical Society. We hope you enjoyed today's virtual speaker series. Please be sure to visit our website, www.danvershistory.org, to find out details about our upcoming virtual events and programs. We truly appreciate everyone's support, help, and teamwork in making these virtual events possible. We want to thank our speakers, DCAT, our volunteers, members, and trustees. We hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Thank you. Good morning, I'm David McKenna, Vice President of the Danvers Historical Society. Today in my 18th century clothing, I am also known as Eliezer Goodale, who was a member of the Danvers Alarmless Company in 1775. We are standing here at the training field, also known as Danvers Common, Common being a place that belonged to the people in Common, where they could graze their livestock if they needed to. But this was donated to the town by Deacon Nathaniel Ingersoll in, the, uh, in his will in 1719 uh, for a place for Danvers men to train forever. So this is where they would have trained every Saturday morning. Militias were formed actually as soon as the colonists came over to this continent from Europe to be prepared to protect themselves for any enemy that might attack, whether it be the Native Americans, some of which, some of whom, were not happy with the colonists being here. They also later had to protect themselves from the French during the French and Indian War which I believe was also known as the Seven Years' War in Europe. Eventually it became necessary for the uh, colonists to defend themselves against the regular army of the British uh, Kingdom when we declared our independency from them. So what we're going to do now is do a little bit of demonstration of some of the maneuvers that were done as part of the training because Timothy Pickering, our colonel, who's headquartered in Salem, wrote a manual known as an easy plan of discipline for the militia. And he might have thought it was easy, but it was quite complicated. It was almost 200 pages. So Danvers had nine militia companies of various types. Everyone who was between the ages of 16 and 60 would belong to one sort of militia company or another. The younger fellas were in an alarm list. They were the ones who would drop everything at the sound of an alarm and run off to wherever they would need it. The militia would hold back a little bit and wait for orders and then march off together because they were a little older. But they, were, had, they had to be well trained, according to Colonel Timothy Pickering of Salem, who was our commander for this area and he developed an pl easy plan of discipline for the militia, which was about 200 pages long, and went into great detail about how everything should be done. As you may have known, or maybe you don't know, during the, during the Revolutionary War, the Americans did not fight from behind trees and stone walls like everybody thinks they did. Other than the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which we'll discuss a little later, they actually did fight in linear tactics, the same as the European armies did, because that was considered the honorable way to wage a war, not shooting like an Indian from behind a tree. That was considered cowardly by the British and the French troops. So they did fire in linear tactics, and they had to know how to report themselves, how to operate their muskets. We'll show the firing sequence itself a little bit later, but some of the different methods for carrying the musket, obviously the prime position was shoulder your fire lock. Advanced fire lock was another method by which you could carry it in a slightly different position to take the weight off your left arm if you were marching for a while or carrying it for a while. You could also carry a fire lock in your right hand, some also known as trail firearms at some times. Secure fire lock, in case it got rainy or damp, you would cover the lock 
with your coat because of the lock of powder got wet, you would not fire. Hence the term fair weather patriots was a truism back then because if it wasn't good weather, you couldn't fire your muskets. They only had battles during good weather. You could also, as I said, shoulder, slope fire locks. There's another way to take the weight off your arms if you're carrying it for a long time. There probably were a couple of others that I'm not remembering at the moment. Uh, oh, order fire lock is like this. Rest your arms is like this. Uh, also known as ease your arms. They use different commands at different times. As far as marching and turning, they had to be able to march smartly in straight rows. And you may notice too, my hat, which is called a cocked hat, because it is cocked a little bit. When you're standing in line, you're supposed to be looking to the right to make sure you're in a straight line with the rest of the troops. So if I had my hat on straight, that obviously wouldn't work, it would hit the musket. So you wore it cocked a little bit, so you could do that. So then to turn, right turn, you step back and turn. Left turn, you step forward and turn. Right about face, you have to grab your uh, cartridge box so it doesn't swing because you're standing so close to the people around you. You step back, turn on your heel, and put your hand down. Right about face, hand there. Turn around, and you're facing forward again. Um, marching is pretty much the same as what it would be today. You would march off in different directions, face, right face, wheels where the whole line would wheel at one time, sometimes from the end, sometimes from the middle. Uh, so that if you're marching toward an enemy and someone appeared on your left, you could wheel the face so you're facing toward them. So there are a lot of things they had to know how to do. One of the other things that they had to do was fix bayonets. You may have noticed the bayonet on my hip. Maybe you didn't. It is a 14 inch long blade that goes onto the end of the musket. Turns your musket into a seven foot long spear, which when you charge the enemy was a fearsome weapon. Charge! And the American troops took a long time to get used to using the bayonet because you see a bunch of British grenadiers coming at you with their bayonets leveled and howling. It could be rather frightening. But in battle, the troops would fire two or three volleys at the other side, advancing a little closer each time, and then eventually charge bayonets. And whoever left the field obviously lost the battle. So if you kept the field, you won. And it was actually considered more honorable to kill someone with a bayonet than with a musket. The musket was just to cause disorder. Uh, Harken back to the old days of fighting with swords. Um, cold steel was more honorable than hot lead. So that's the way they fought battles. Again, rank on rank of men firing at each other. They actually would fire in three ranks. And the front rank would kneel to fire, they fire a volley. Second rank fired and stood in place, fired over their heads. And the rear rank would take a half step to the right and fire between the men in the second rank. So in a volley, you're putting like about probably 300 ball in the air toward the enemy. And it could raise havoc. This is why during the Civil War, when they had more accurate and more powerful weapons, were still using those type of tactics. It was such a bloody war, because a lot more people got injured or killed by the more superior weapons in the old tactics. What you see I'm wearing is not a uniform, because remember, we were civilian militia. We were, not, we were not uniformed like the British troops were, the Redcoats, nor the Continental Line that formed later. Even at the beginning of the Revolution, half of the Continental Line was still wearing civilian clothing. We would have been called up in an emergency if an alarm were sounded 
and we would basically go and grab our musket and our accoutrements that we were supposed to have with us and appear here at the training field to assemble to march off to, to take care of whatever emergency it was. So just to give you an idea what I'm carrying, I'm carrying a musket. Sometimes it would be my own, but more often it was supplied by the town. This is actually a Charleville musket, which is a French military musket that the town purchased uh, to supply their troops. The men were supposed to keep that in good condition, keep it cleaned and ready to operate. It's a 69 caliber weapon, and as you'll see a little later, it's operated by Flint. We'll go into that detail a little later though. We also have, and it weighs about 12 pounds. It's a heavy weapon. Some of them are as much as 15 pounds. So that was why they needed different methods of carrying it. You saw the bayonet, which fits over the end of the weapon. There was an earlier form of bayonet that actually looked like a big bowie knife with a narrow handle that actually stuck into the barrel. The problem with that is you could not fire your musket while you had your bayonet attached. And if you did happen to stab somebody with it, you then had to go retrieve it because it would stick in them and not stay on your musket like these bayonets did. I'm also carrying a cartridge box made of leather with a wooden block inside which can carry approximately 20 to 24 rounds. The cartridges were made of paper, usually used print or something along that line, and a ball on the bottom of it, tied and then powder on top, and as you will see, the soldier would bite the top off the thing to expose the cartridge to expose the powder, prime his pan and then load it. And the town would supply the cartridges as well as the musket. And some of the other gear we're wearing is going to be um, I have a haversack, which is a possibles bag I can put wherever I need to carry with me, some spare flints maybe a little bit of jerked meat or cheese to, to eat on the way. Um, sometimes we'd have a um, canteen. I don't have one today with me. I'm also carrying a short sword, which many gentlemen would have carried a sword back those days. Um, coat, waistcoat, the cocked hat, which I mentioned earlier. Some men wore tricorns. Some men just wore a big, a uh, floppy, flat-brimmed hat, because that's what they would have been using probably out in the field when they're farming, just to shave their faces. I'm wearing boots. Most men wore shoes that had buckles. Um, you notice I've got some facial hair, which unfortunately I wasn't about to shave for today, but it would not have been proper in the 1700s. People then would clean shave, and if you look at the old uh, paintings, um, the signing of the declaration, all the men were, were bare faced, no, no facial hair, it just was not considered proper. 1600s was a lot of it, 1800s it was, during that period everybody was clean shaven. Trousers, um, were a little different than today's, today we have a fly in the front, back then they had a flap, uh, very similar to the flap on the back of your baby brother's uh, Dr. Denton uh, beat, uh, PJs. Uh, they didn't have zippers yet. Those wouldn't be invented for quite a while. Okay, as we said earlier, we're gonna give a little demonstration now on the musket, how it works, and how they loaded and fired and the fact of how quickly they were supposed to be able to fire. What I'm going to show you first is how the musket mechanism actually works. As you can see, there is the hammer that has a piece of flint in it, a piece of stone actually, and this is the, called the hammer stall or frizzin. When we end this, I'll open it now to show you this little opening right here they call the pan, which is where the powder would go, a little priming would go there, there's a little tiny hole right here that goes through into the barrel to the main charge. So when I pull the trigger, the flint hits the hammer stall 
creates a spark, which we'll see in a second, and then fires the musket. So let me cock it. Now remember, it's not loaded now, but watch for the spark. And that's what causes the musket to fire. So I'm going to back up now, and we'll actually go through the firing by commands. The troops would start at shoulder. The first order would be, come cast about. Open your pan. Open the pan. Handle your cartridge. And I reach out of my cartridge box, pull out a cartridge, <laughs> bite the top off, and hold it up here. Prime. Pour a little bit of powder into that. Shut your pan. Back up here to let the officers know I'm ready. Bow. Put the musket down. Load. I will pour the cartridge into the musket, which would have a ball in the bottom of it. Then I'd ram it down and return my rammer. Shoulder. Come back to shoulder. The next order would be as ranks make ready. I'm going to turn that fire towards you. Cock the musket. Present. And fire. Back to recover. And then shoulder. We're now going to give a demonstration of a timed firing sequence. Just so you can see how difficult it was for them to be able to fire as the manual directed every 15 seconds. So, I'm about to start now. I'm going to turn slightly sideways again. The order would be, prime and load. This takes a while to accomplish. His ranks make ready, present, fire! Remember, too, you were supposed to be able to do this quickly while someone's shooting at you. Ranks make ready. Fire! slower process than modern guns that they just put bullocks in and pull the trigger. Fire! Now, theoretically, by the manual, I should have had this loaded and ready to fire this fourth round in less than a minute, and I'm probably going to be closer to two minutes. So I'm stuck in the training field for a while to learn to do this better. Present. Fire. How long was that? Two minutes, 34 seconds. More than twice as long as it should have taken if I were a well-trained militia. So you can see it's not quite as simple a process as you would think. And as I said, you were standing in line shoulder to shoulder with a hundred more men, probably a hundred yards from a row of the enemy 
standing at the same distance and shoulder to shoulder firing at you. And you have to remember too, because you're shooting at a mass of men, you didn't actually aim. You would just point in the general direction and hope you hit something. And in fact, the French would turn the face the other way to avoid the possibility of getting a flash burn and the arrive from the powder going off right here. So that is how the musket operated. We are here standing now in front of a memorial that was put up to the men who died during the Revolutionary War, also known as the War of Independence or Independency back then. You may remember we said that we are training in case of hostilities. Tensions have been building in the colonies for quite a while. You've read about the tax on the tea, the Stamp Act, representation without uh, taxation without representation and many other things that were upsetting the colonists. It finally came to a head, it came very close to a head in February over in Salem at the Salem-Danvers border when they almost had a confrontation there but managed to avoid hostilities. But on April 19th, early in the morning, the British governor sent troops out to Lexington and Concord to try to arrest uh, Sam Adams, John Hancock, and the others that he considered revolutionaries and confiscate the colonial's arms. When that happened, the alarm was sounded. You've heard uh, Hawthorne's poem, Listen, my children, you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Well, there was Paul Revere. There were also three other men who set off from Boston that morning. William Dawes and Samuel Prescott each went a different direction to give the alarm to the, the neighborhoods. Now you've all heard them say the British are coming, the British are coming. Well, we were British, so that wasn't what they said. What they said was the regulars are out and they're marching to Lexington and called on men to come to arms. Now the word was further spread by other post riders. Somebody would have ridden into Danvers with the message that this was happening because of course they didn't have cell phones back then. So they used post riders. So the bell started sounding at the church where the men were probably mostly all at church service at the time. They went and collected their arms and their gear and they assembled here on the training field where we, you just saw us training. And they would have then marched off toward Lexington. As they were going, they were getting updates about where the British troops were, and they would adjust their route. They finally caught up with the British Army in what is now known as Arlington. Back then they called it Monotomy. The Danvers troops took up positions in the yards of a gentleman named Jason Russell behind some shingles and a stone wall. As I said, they weren't firing linear tactics yet because they weren't that well trained. What they didn't realize is as the British Army was marching down Mass Ave, they also had flanking units on side streets to protect their flanks or their sides. And the Colonials got caught in a vicious crossfire. As a result, seven Danvers men were killed that day, as well as several others. Danvers had the most casualties that day of any other town, well, than any other town except Lexington. Here on the memorial are the names of all the men who died during the Revolutionary War, including those who died on April 19th. They were uh, Samuel Cook, Jr., Benjamin Deland, Jr., uh, Ebenezer Goldwaith, uh, Henry Jacobs, Jr., Curly Putnam, uh, George Southwick, Jr., uh, Jonathan, Jotham Webb, and that is all of the men who died on that day. One of them, I believe was young Putnam, was only 16 years old at the time, and I believe he dropped dead along the march, not actually in the battle. But 
took, but these men, all of them listed on this monument, gave their lives for the freedoms that we hold dear today. We have two other memorials here, one in front of me for the Mexican War from 1846 to 1848, where Danvers lost two men, Benjamin Berry, and behind me, another monument to the War of 1812, when Nathan Smith in Nehemiah Trask perished, again protecting the freedom of our country. We owe a great debt of gratitude to all those from these wars and all subsequent wars who gave their lives and sacrificed so much for our freedom. And now in honor of them, I'm going to, as we would have in the 18th century, mourn arms. To all who sacrificed so much for this country, thank you. Thank you for spending time with the Danvers Historical Society. Please be sure to visit our website to donate at www.danvershistory.org. Have a nice day.